Well, we're going to go to John fourteen twelve, and um, we're going to we're going to touch on this um, this next piece today. And um, if you missed last week, I encourage you to go back and listen to it because you are a valuable masterpiece. And uh, you need to understand that and grasp that because a lot of times we don't see ourselves as that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up our, our um, message this morning with a verse of scripture that is extremely controversial as to what it actually means. Because everybody's got an opinion about it. And I think Jesus really just meant one thing. Literally what he said. Um, John fourteen twelve says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who believes in me, is that you? Do you believe in Jesus this morning? Mm-hmm. Listen to this. The works that I do, who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He's saying the works, Jesus is saying the works that I do, he will do also who? Those that believe. What, so what? So what is he say, What is he saying right there? So we, I mean, that's hard to even wrap our mind around. Wait a minute, Jesus raised the dead. Uh-huh. Jesus healed the sick. Uh-huh. Jesus rebuked demons. Uh-huh. Jesus calmed the storm and walked on water. Uh-huh. So did Peter. Don't forget, Peter also walked on water. Yeah, he may have sunk, but at least he walked on water. <laughs> Think about that. Those that believe will do the same works that he did. Now, this is the part that gets controversial. That first part kind of gets a little controversial because there's some people that believe all the miracle signs and wonders ended in the New Testament. And I was like, well, you can serve your dead God, but my God's still alive. <laughs> my God's a God of miracles. But he says he will do also, but listen to the last part of this. And greater works than these he will do because I am going to my Father. Huh? What in the world does he mean by and greater works than these he will do? What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying greater works will the believer do than he did because he goes to his Father. Now, I don't want to necessarily focus on the word greater. I don't think that's necessarily important. Because any work that's not done by the Holy Spirit's work is just a human work. So whether it's greater or not greater don't matter because it's still done by the Holy Spirit. So what, what's he talking about here? Works are important. Works are important. It says once... You know, once we accept Jesus, and see, we, we like these, we like the part, the first part of this. We like the first part that says, oh, I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. You know what? I'm his master, valuable masterpiece. Now that I'm his valuable masterpiece and I'm precious to him, and, you know, I know all the names that I have now because I'm a new creation. You know, it's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, you know, and we got all this stuff going on. We get all excited about that. We get excited with the apple of his eye. We get, we get excited about the fact that we are his delight now. We get excited the fact that now he's made me good. He's made me holy. He's made me righteous. He's made me a child of God and a saint of God. He's made me the offspring of God. You know, we get excited the fact that, we're his treasure and we are his beloved. We get excited that we are his masterpiece. But then we get to this part that says works. And we're like, oh, you mean I got to do something? Uh-huh. You got to get off your lazy spiritual butt and do something. It's talking about commitment. It's talking about being reliable. It's talking about showing up when you need to show up and do what you need to do when you need to do it. It's talking about producing works as a valuable masterpiece in Jesus Christ. See, we can say we believe all we want. It does us no good. Our mouth is worthless until we got the actions to back it up. You can tell me you love Jesus all day long. I don't care. You can tell me that all day. I know a lot of drunks and addicts and all kinds of people out there that say they love Jesus, but they need deliverance. 
I know people that's never gone to church before say they love Jesus, but they don't even back in the doors of church, don't even know what the first page of the Bible, even the first book of the Bible is, can't even quote you John 3, 16, and don't even know how to get saved. You think they know Jesus? They don't know Jesus. They don't love Jesus. They think they love Jesus, but they don't. Because your life will testify to what you believe. Your life will testify to what you believe. Do you believe God is holy and that you need to be a holy person? Then you're going to live holy. Do you believe God is righteous and that he's made you righteous and that you need to be a righteous person? Then you're going to be righteous. Do you believe that adultery is wrong? If you believe adultery is wrong, then don't commit adultery. If you, don't, if you believe gossiping is wrong, then don't go gossip. If you believe that certain things are wrong, then don't do them. But then on the other side, if you believe certain things are right, then go do them. Go do them. If we believe loving our enemy is what the gospel tells us to do when it comes to love, and truly, you've not really loved until you had to love your enemy, then go love your enemy. But quit talking about it and go do something about it. We live in a world where we just all talk, 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 talk. We like to hear, 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 but we, we're, we're lazy people. We live in a, in a time... People are just lazy. I don't know how else to say it. They're just lazy. And there's no excuse for it. And God does not want a lazy Christian. He doesn't want someone who wants to be bottle fed all their life. There ain't nothing worse than seeing that some kid that's, that's older than a toddler nursing on his mama. If the kid's got teeth, Get him off of it. <laughs> but you know how many people that we have in a church that's got teeth and are still sucking on the nipple of the bottle. And then when they pop by the hole and that milk pours out all over them, they're wondering, what just happened? Why is this such a mess? It's because you're supposed to have grown up. You're supposed to have matured. You're supposed to have gone beyond the point of where you are at and realize that, yeah, you are valuable. Yes, you are a masterpiece. Yes, you are precious to God. Yes, you have been adopted, but you have to mature in your faith and do something with your spiritual life. See, we sit back in these in, in chairs and we think, oh, well, God will do it. And God is looking at you and saying, no, you get up and do it, and I will strengthen you to do it. But we sit back in our chair. You know, I quit cleaning my kids' rooms when they got about, I don't know, 10 years old, 9, 10 years old. I didn't clean up after my kids anymore. And one of my kids... The room got pretty smelly. I wasn't going to clean it. And uh, my, one of my kids had friends come over. And their friends were like, why does your room smell so bad? Why, what is it? That, this stinks in here. I don't want to sleep in your bedroom. Can you ask your dad if we go downstairs and sleep on the couch or something? I don't want to sleep in this bedroom. It stinks in here. And lo and behold, my kid learned a fast lesson. Clean up after yourself. You know, I never had to clean that bedroom again. Never. Now, was the kid perfect in picking up after herself? No. I don't think we all, any of us are perfect at that. But, you know, I never had to clean up that bedroom again because they learned a valuable lesson. When you don't put feet to your faith, you don't grow up, you don't do something, you create a mess. You know, there's a statement when it comes to works, and I want you to think about this for a second. When we say we're Christian and we tell the world, that we are a Christian, yet we're not living out what we say we believe, we are misrepresenting God. The world calls it hypocrisy. The Bible calls it being a false witness. 
Wow. Being a false witness is one of the Ten Commandments. Bear not a false, don't be a false witness. Don't be a liar. And when we fail to display the splendor of God, when we fail to live up to our belief and what we say we believe, this is exactly what we are doing. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be considered a child of God that is going around bearing false witness of my father. I want to be a child of God that when the world sees me, they see the splendor of Jesus. They see the grace of Jesus. They see the love of Jesus. They see the mercy of Jesus. They see all that Jesus is. So the question is, is how do we display this? How do we display his splendor? How do we display his glory? How do we take a human messed up, frail person and allow a perfect God to work through to create splendor in the earth. Well, let's go back to Ephesians 2.10 because and we're actually going to go back to Timothy here in a minute, which we started in January with. But Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Good works. So in other words, I'm his valuable masterpiece, because that's basically what workmanship means. I'm his valuable masterpiece to do what? Created to do good works. Good works. What does that tell me? That tells me God's given me a purpose. He's given me a purpose. What is my purpose as a child of God? To do good things. To do excellent things. Now, when we read on um, and we look at 1 Timothy 4.12, let's go back to 1 Timothy 4.12, and we started in January with this verse of Scripture. And we kind of, we, we, we walk through pieces of this, and we're actually going to finish the latter part of 1 Timothy 4.12 this morning, believe it or not, even though we started in January. This is the end of February. But you're going to see how all this ties in. Because, see, displaying God's splendor can be limited by our lack of understanding of how valuable of a masterpiece we are. See, I don't believe that people maliciously go around and just try to mis intentionally misrepresent God. I don't. I think the problem is, is people don't understand the valuable masterpiece that they really are in God. And because they lack the understanding of how valuable they are, in God and because of what God has done for them in their life, they just go around and do what they do. But once we begin to understand the value that we have for the kingdom and we understand the masterpiece that God is creating us to be and that he's, he's deeming us to be and the purpose that he's giving us and this sort of thing, we have this idea, we have this desire, we have these thoughts, we have whatever you want to call it, that begin to motivate our life to do what? Good things. And I don't begin to do good things because I'm trying to fulfill a list, but I begin to do good things because I'm trying to live out what I believe. I begin to live out what I say I love. I say I love Jesus. I'm going to love Jesus. How do I love Jesus? Jesus tells me that I love him by doing what? Obeying his commands. Obeying his commands. Which goes back to what? Works. Works. So when we go back to 1 Timothy 4.12 and we understand from Ephesians 2.10, I'm created to do good things, we go back to 1 Timothy 4.12 and what does 1 Timothy 4.12 tell us? It gives us a list of works. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example to those who believe. Now, here's something worth repeating. The first part of this verse, we tend to not have too much of a problem with. We understand the concept of speech. I need to watch my mouth. We understand our, 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 our idea of conduct. We, we get that. We need to watch how our lifestyle is. We understand most of the time the concepts of love. You know, still have, to have a hard time sometimes wrapping our head around it. But the ideas of love. But here's the one that, here's the two that trip us up. Faith and purity. Faith and purity. 
Because when we see this word faith in the, in the English version of the Bible, the very first thing that we always run to is, well, I don't have that kind of faith. That's not what he's talking about here. The word faith in this verse actually means faithfulness. Faithfulness. What is this telling me? That means I need to be faithful in my example. I need to be faithful that in my speech, that in my conduct, that in my love, and that in my purity, the world is able to see Jesus. Faithful. It's not talking about what I believe. It's talking about living it out. In this verse, faith refers to this, this idea of proving my conviction by what I do. I prove my conviction by what I do, my faithful action. In other words, being committed by action to what I say I believe. Because here's the thing is if you work it but you don't believe it, all you did was create law. But if you work it and you believe it, you've created relationship, and now you've got moments of grace. A lot of people in a religious circle, they err into works creating a law, and what does end up happening? People get judgmental. People get harsh. People begin to get critical. People get the fault finding, you know, get all this other mess. But when people put their beliefs and they put their convictions and their works together, they begin to realize that I'm still falling short. I need to offer the same grace that I need for my own life to others. Because it begins to be motivated out of love. As that old saying goes, if I don't live it, I don't believe it. <laughs> it's that simple. If I don't live it, I don't believe it. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I could spend five minutes with somebody, and I could tell you what they believe and where they are in a relationship with God. I could tell you. Is it because I got some fancy training or whatever? No, it's not that at all. Watch them. Watch them. Spend a day with somebody. You'll know what they truly believe. Listen to how they talk. Watch how they treat others. You'll, you'll see. You'll know. Because their life will testify to what they truly believe. Purity in 1 Timothy 4.12 refers to the concept of chastity. And spirit and character and action. Now the word chastity, for anybody that doesn't know this word or has heard this word only in the context of refraining from premarital sex in this verse it actually refers to refraining from any aspect of evil in our spirit or in our character or in our actions so chastity is basically refraining from evil in any aspect of our lives paul um, wrote it this way in romans 16 19 through 20 and i like this i like the i really like verse 20 in this you're going to see why in a minute. But Paul, write, Paul writes it this way in Romans 16, 19 through 20 um, when it comes to evil and purity. He says, for the report of your obedience has reached everyone. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. Wow. Would you say we live in a world that's lost its innocence? Uh huh. Yeah. We don't get bashful on stuff anymore. You know, I can't even begin to tell you the last time that somebody that or I saw somebody who literally was like, um, well, bashful is not really the word to use. I guess it's um. And offended really isn't the word either. Um, just someone who blushes because evil has walked into the room and it has just caused them to blush. Um, I'm trying to find the right word and I'm not finding it. Um, it, it, it. It's hard to find that anywhere anymore. You know, evil walks in the room. It's like, oh, we're so familiar with it. It doesn't bother me anymore. Well, it should. Evil should bother us. 
It should bother us. But we don't let it bother us anymore. Why? Because we've lost our innocence. We've become so familiar with it. And Paul's telling the church, he's saying, I want you to be wise and good, but I want you to be innocent in what is evil. Be innocent about it. Be wise in what is good. Know what God expects out of you. Know what God wants out of you. And when it comes to evil, don't even think about it. But we're so busy trying to ride the fence. I don't know how many conversations I get into with people. If I do this, can I still go to heaven? Well, if you're in doubt, why are you doing it? Love Jesus more than that. If you really, really love Jesus, you won't even be asking that question. You'll be asking the question, how far from hell can I get so I can grab a hold of Jesus more? You won't even be asking those compromising, riding the fence questions. You know, like the old preacher used to say, you can go ahead and ride the fence all you want, but I guarantee, you know, if you're riding barbed wire, you're going to end up a real bad mess. Because it's going to get you. You can't compromise. Be innocent in what is good. Wise, innocent in what is evil, and be wise in what is good. In verse 20, it says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And I, I, it's amazing to me how Paul ties that verse into right after that. Right after that. So that tells me what? That tells me that I need to be wise in good things. I need to be wise. I need to figure out what a good thing am I needing to do that somehow or another this verse that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under my feet, that my goodness brings the splendor and glory of God into the earth in such a way that it crushes the enemy's head every time I do it. You want to crush the enemy's head? You get you 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 dislike somebody, or you get in a war with somebody, or whatever you want to call it. I tell you what, go love on them for a while. You want to drive them nuts? Go love on them. The yeah, Bible says you'll heap coals on the enemy's head. Go love on them. You'll drive them nuts. Good always outweighs evil. So we could, we could say with confidence, Timothy is, Timothy is telling them, be an example. Be a faithful example by not allowing evil to be part of your spirit or your character or your actions. In other words, live what you believe. Don't just say, I believe it. Live it. So let's understand what works for, in, for a while here for a second. We knew It's important that we understand this because... If we don't grasp this, we'll think, well, then that means I can just work for my salvation, and you're totally wrong. Because there is a false doctrine out there that says, and I did say false doctrine, so if anybody is out there with this false doctrine, sorry, I just called you false. I am just I believe the truth, and the Bible tells me that by grace I'm saved through faith, not of works of my own. So the first thing that we need to understand about works is that works has nothing to do with the fact that I'm trying to earn my salvation. I'm not trying to earn God's love for me. God is going to love you more today than he will tomorrow. He will always love you the same forever, and there's nothing you can do to change that. You can't earn more of it. You can't get more of it. You can't receive more of it. All you can do is embrace it more. But he is going to love you the same today and tomorrow and forever, all the same, all the time. His grace will always be the same. His mercy will always be the same. You cannot earn more of God. Now, there's some people who like to think you can, but you can't. You can't earn more of God. So works don't save us. Works don't gain us more of God. Works is an expression of our love for God. Matter of fact, Jesus said in John chapters 14, 15, and 16, if you love me, you obey my commands. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, if you love me, you're going to put feet to your faith and you're going to quit talking about what you believe and you're going to start doing something about it. 
That's what he's saying. Love, or I'm sorry, works does not save us. Love and works are inseparable. And I just mentioned that in John 14, chapter 14, 15, and 16. They're inseparable. Matter of fact, 1 John, I love this verse, 1 John 3, 17 through 18, records a very powerful statement because, see, we, we talked about love a while back when we were in 1 Timothy 4, 12 and the impact of love and, and how we need to be loving people. And love is never really love until it's tested. And we can say we love all day long, but until that love is tested, it's really not love. And 1 John three seventeen through 18, there's, here's kind of a test in a sense of love. He says, but whoever has worldly goods, uh, goods and sees his brother or sister in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God remain in him? Little children, let's not love with word and with tongue, but in deed and truth. What's he saying? He's saying quit talking about it and do something about it. Do something about it. You, you, you say you love your brother. You say you love your sister. And yet you know they're in need of something and you're not doing a thing about it. What the heck is that? Love has evidence. Works and love are inseparable. Works are the fruit of our faith. Works affirm our belief. Matter of fact, faith and works are inseparable, and they should begin to mirror one another. If one, is, is, if one says, I have faith, and they don't have works, then it's dead. If one says, I have works, but they don't have faith, then it's dead. So what, what does this mean? That means my faith and my, or my beliefs and my works have to mirror one another. They have to come together as one in unison to what? To bring splendor of God on the earth. In James 2, chapter 2, and I'm not going to go through all these verses, but chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, James really drives this point home hard in a very short, pass in a very short passage. Because I, I love what he says, because works accompanies our faith. Our faith, when, when works begins to accompany our faith and it became inseparable and they become one, they become perfected in God. And they begin to justify our belief system. And in James chapter 2, it says, in the, same in the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But are you willing to acknowledge, I love this question, but are you willing to acknowledge, you foolish person, and I just learned from this past week the actual word foolish in the Greek means moron. Um, so we could put this in a different way, but are you willing to acknowledge, you moron person, <laughs> That faith without works is useless? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. What is J Oh, wow, wow, we don't, want to, we don't like that verse. Because let's go back. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, thought, I thought you said I'm not saved by works. You're right, you're not saved by works. But you're not saved by faith alone either. They work together. Jesus, or Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I am a new creation in Christ. All the old things have passed away, and behold, here comes the new. What is, what is Paul saying? He's saying, I have evidence of being saved. I have evidence of loving Jesus. I have evidence of him being in my life and being in a relationship with him. And that evidence is by what I do. Wow. Wow. What's your evidence this morning? What's your evidence? Jesus Matthew 25, 31 through 46. I'm going to read this passage to you. I love this passage because this really brings the heart of Jesus to a lot. It says a lot. Matthew 25, 31 through 46 says, But when a son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, 
Then he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. Uh, so, yeah, clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thir or and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come fall and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, the extent that you did for the one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did for me. What is Jesus saying? He's saying your evidence, going back all the way to January when we're talking about love. Love is action. It's not passive. It's action. And what is Jesus saying here? He's saying those that know me love, and they love through action. And it's the evidence of knowing me. Our works come from a place of love. I come to church because I love Jesus. I read my Bible because I love Jesus. I give because I love Jesus. I, 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 I make the sacrifices necessary for ministry or whatever I need to do because I love Jesus. Yeah, I love people, but I love Jesus more. Does that mean I love people less? Yes, I do love people a little less. Because I love Jesus more. But you know, the more I love Jesus, the more I begin to love people. Because I can't love Jesus without loving his people. Can't do it. It's inseparable. Jesus talks about that several times. First John talks about that numerous times. You cannot love Jesus and not love his people. You cannot love Jesus and not love people in general. Because Jesus takes it to the extent that you cannot love Jesus without loving your enemy. You can't love Jesus without loving those that despise you and use you and say all bad things against you. Jesus takes it very far. It's all about tying it back in to love. What is, what is love? Love is an action. Love is a work. It's inseparable. We can say we believe God and we trust God all day long, but until you walk it out, it's nothing. It's useless. We're created for good works. Works express his beauty, his benefit, his value, and his virtue through us. I want you to catch that. Our works express his beauty, his benefit, his value, and his virtue through us. To me, that's amazing. That God would use us so flawed, so messed up at times, yet still wants to use us to bring splendor of him throughout this earth. How does he do that? By good works. Good works. You know, it, it, when you think about it, it's just humbling. Humbling. So what's it mean to live in peace with God. You think, well, Pastor, you sound like you're running down a rabbit trail. You'll see where I'm going to go in a second. What does it mean to live at peace with God? To live at peace with God means to be constantly working out my salvation by saying, I believe this and now I'm doing this. I believe this, now I'm doing this. Because I'm in this love relationship with Jesus. And I'm not in the pursuit of trying to prove my love to him. I'm in a pursuit of trying to say, Jesus, Jesus, look how much I love you. 
I'm going to go down here and I see a car on the side of the road broke down. I pull over and I help them. Why? Because I love Jesus. I'm in a grocery store and there's a woman behind me and, and, and she, I, I can hear her coming, going through her purse and she's got a couple of kids and I could tell she's short on her money and, and so my bill's paid and I go on through the line and my bill's paid and I just kind of stand there a minute as she's going up, you can see the nervousness on her face and you hand her a 20. Why? Because you love Jesus. Why? Because you love Jesus. When we unite our faith in our works, when we begin to unite, I want you to catch this. When we unite our faith in our works, we become an echo of God's splendor in the earth. I want you to catch that. When we begin to unite our faith in our works, we become an echo of God's splendor in the earth. And it begins to get displayed through us. First, uh, Philippians 2, 12 through 13 says that we display his splendor for what reason? For his pleasure. <laughs> to bring him glory. Philippians 2, 12 through 13 says this. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in in you both to do what desire and to work for his good pleasure wow he works it out in you why you know the more i get in the presence of god the more i want to do for god the more i want to do for god it's because i love him more and more and more and more you know what i'm saying and the more you get into his presence the more you experience him the more that you want to be around him the more you want to know about him the more that you realize the love, the depth of love that he has for you, the more you want to do for him. Not because you're trying to prove anything, not because you're trying to work for your salvation, not because you're trying to earn something from God, but because I simply love Jesus. Simply love Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says this. And we've kind of, we sung a song about this this morning. For 2 Corinthians 3, 18, but we all with unveiled faces looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as from the Lord the Spirit. What, what, what is Paul saying here? He's saying as you're maturing in Christ, you're going from glory to glory to glory. As you begin to align your faith and you begin to align what you believe in your faith, with the works, the things that you're doing in your life, the more splendious, I don't even know if that's a word, that God begins to be expressed to you in this earth. Have you ever walked into a room and people just know you're a Christian and you didn't say a word? How do they know that? Even the world, how do they know that? Because they can pick up on what is pure, what is righteous, what is loving, what is holy, what is virtuous, what is beneficial. Even those that do not know Jesus can pick up on that. The question is, is that what you are displaying? Because if we're not displaying it, then... We're being a false witness. To say I'm a child of God and to say that I believe something and to not live it out. The world has a good favorite word for it. I'm a hypocrite. And I don't know about you, but I think this world has seen enough of hypocrites. It's time they see Jesus. But you're the splendor. The works that you do is what brings the splendor of him into the earth. Psalm 8, 3 through 5. I'll, I'll just wrapping my mind around this verse just like, whoa. But Psalm 8, 
3 through 5 says this, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you think of him, and a son of man that you are concerned about him? Like, get this verse right here. Yet you have made him, talking about who? You and me. Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. What in the world? Try to wrap your head around that one. He's made us a little lower than God, because I don't know if you realize this or not. Don't ever worship an angel. Why? Because we stand in judgment of angels. Angels are lower than we are. They're lower than we are. One day we will stand in judgment of angels. If you worship angels, you're worshiping something that is less than yourself. Because God created you a little lower than himself. Matter of fact, the Bible says that we were made in his own image or in his own likeness because God wanted something that was similar to him. He made us a little lower than him. We're not God. We're not gods. We're a little lower than him, and he crowns us with glory and majesty. Why? Because he wants us to be the song and the story and the poem and everything else and the essence of, of who he is in this earth so that when we go out into the streets or we go into the marketplace or we go into a restaurant or we go into to a car dealership or we go into wherever we are at that when people see us they see jesus if they see you and they're not experiencing jesus you're being a false witness by proclaiming that i'm a christian I know that's kind of harsh, but it's the reality of what it is. We don't need false witnesses in this world. we got enough false narratives and a lot of false information and a lot of false junk that goes on in this world. And we don't need any more false Christians. We need people who display his splendor throughout all the earth by what they say, by what they do, how they love one another. Am I saying that we are perfect? We will never be perfect. So just get your head out trying to be perfect. But you are called to do the works of displaying his splendor. I do what I do because I love Jesus. I love Jesus, so this is what I do. And because I do what I do because I love Jesus, I become the splendor of his glory throughout all the earth. You are a masterpiece, a valuable masterpiece to God. Why? So that you can do good things, Chris. Good things. Good things, Letitia. Good things. You're the splendor of God, Grandma Betty. <laughs> the splendor of God. Because he's created us to be that way. You're saying, well, we can't share in the glory of God. I'm going to show you something right now. Because I used to think that lie. I've heard it preached. Oh, God won't share his glory. Oh, yes, he will. I'm going to show you. John 17, 22 through 23. Because we're supposed to be the splendor of his glory in the earth. God wants to share his glory with you. And I'll prove that. John 17, 22 through 23. Jesus is talking to the Father. He said, the glory which you gave me, I also have given to who? Them. So that they may be one just as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and you loved them just as you loved me. Notice what, he t notice what he says here. How does the world know about this love relationship? Because Jesus said, Father, give them the same glory that you gave me. 
Wow. Well, I thought God doesn't share in his glory. I'm telling you right now, this verse right here will blow that out of the water. God wants you to share in his glory. He doesn't want you to get, you know, the big head and think you did it all. That's called pride. That's wrong. But I think what we've done is we have eliminated or, or, or devalued the glory of God to this concept that I can't share in the glory of God because that means I'm prideful. Well, if you're prideful, you can't share in the glory anyway. Because pride is sin, and you can't, you can't share in the glory of God. But Jesus is saying right here in this verse, Father, I want you to give them the same glory that you gave me so that the world will know that we are one in unison and that we have this love relationship so that the world will know who I am through them. Through them. Your works bring splendor. Your works is what brings glory to God. Even in the imperfection of your work, God gives glory. See, when, when Paul wrote, he said that God will work out all things, all things, to those that love God and are called according to his purposes. What's he saying here? He's, Paul is telling everybody, he's saying, if you will do this according to the will of God, if you will do what God is wanting you to do, even in your imperfection, God will work it out for his glory. But you've got to get off your rump and do something about it. You've got to become faithful in the example He's called us to be. And to think that God calls us to do greater things. Greater things. That blows my mind. Going back to our verse earlier. Jesus said, you're going to do greater things. What's he saying? We're going to be doing more works. We're going to bring splendor. We're going to bring glory in this earth by what we do, by what we say, how we love people. We've got enough country club churches around this world. We don't need another country club. We, 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 we don't need none of that. We need legitimate people that are in love with Jesus. That says, I believe this. And because I believe this, I'm going to show it by what I do because I love Jesus. I'm not trying to earn anything because I can't earn it anyway. But I'm going to show myself faithful faithful some people like to talk about anointing you know but when you really look at the word anointing and you begin to understand it a little bit more and this was confirmed last night and I've said this before but it's funny that he, he he confirmed it last night. Anointing or his glory is always attached to love. Love. When we walk outside of love, we all walk outside the very nature of who God is. We got to stay focused and be faithful. Be faithful. I know it gets hard. I know it gets difficult. There's times I like to jack slap people too. Don't ever do it, but doesn't mean I don't think about it. <laughs> but you know what? Still got love. Still got to love. So, you know, just 
You gotta love. We do. I'm a valuable masterpiece. What's my purpose? To do good things. Why? Because it brings him splendor in the earth. You're on display today. You don't think anybody knows what's going on in your life? Ha. I guarantee there's a lot of people that knows what's going on in your life. Is it because people are talking about it? No. They're watching you. Oh, no. I, I, no, don't go down the road. <laughs> but people are watching you. They're watching your life. They're watching... They're listening to what you're saying. They're watching what you're doing. What are you displaying to them? Matter of fact, writer of Hebrews made it this clear. Writer of Hebrews puts it this way. Be very careful when you entertain strangers, lest you entertain angels. What's the writer of Hebrews saying? You are always on display. Be careful what you are displaying. 